Welcome back, everyone. Super excited to have Yvonne on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you for having me. Could you give the listeners a quick introduction about who you are and how you ended up in finance and investing? Yeah, sure. So my name is Yvonne Bajella. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I basically actually started my career in investment banking, so did that for a short period of time, realized it wasn't for me. Um, and then I decided that, you know, I wanted to be closer to the companies because obviously when you come in at the junior level in banking, you don't get exposure to companies. At the time, I didn't really know anything about venture capital. Um, but then I went and did a short sentence strategy consulting. And then I spent the summer of 2013 in Ghana, actually. And during my time there, I was doing pro bono advisory work for a number of startups. And it was the same time where a lot of US venture capitalists were exploring the African venture capital ecosystem. So Jumia, for example, was just being funded at that time. Uh, so there was a lot of hype. And that was really my first exposure to the world of venture capital. And I guess you could say that I caught the entrepreneurship bug. That's when I realized that I wanted to break into VC. Um, so coming back to London that summer, I took it upon myself just to just, just really network and attend every single event trying to break into the world of VC. Luckily, I was introduced to Mitsui, which is a Japanese uh, investment company. I joined their corporate development arm, which also does um, corporate VC. And that's kind of how I broke into the industry. But your way into finance and investment banking, is that just coincidence? Or did you have a drive towards finance growing up? Or how did that look? Yeah, so I guess um, growing up, I was always very good at maths. Um, unlike other children who would go out on Saturday and Sunday, play with their friends, my dad would have me at home reading the Financial Times. So, <laughs> so that meant that I was having to, you know, look at markets. And so from a very early age, from the age of say 10, 10, I was, I had a very good understanding of mark financial markets. And, you know, my dad would be trading in shares and I would take a keen interest in that, which is kind of weird actually, because at that age, you're not really expected to know much about financial markets. but. For me, that's how my um, interest in finance really started. But did he force that interest or did you have it naturally? Or was it a combination? Because when you're young, you're not really sure what you're really passionate about. Yeah, I'd say he kind of forced it on me, but it worked out. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> I mean, what child doesn't want to be playing out on a Saturday? <laughs> great, great point. Can we start a bit about talking about your habits? Because I think you recently wrote a post about how you like to start your day being productive. I think it was like six yeah. tips. Could you explain a typical day to you and how you want it to be? And maybe what are the obstacles you are facing? Because it's hard to have the perfect day every day, right? It is. No, definitely. Um, so many years ago, um, I don't know if you've heard about the 5 a.m. club. A friend of mine started doing that and I tried it and I thought this is great because you wake up in the morning early at 5 a.m. And by the time it's midday, you've got so much done. So you're just so much more efficient. After some time, I realized 5 a.m. doesn't work for me. So <laughs> I started waking up at 6, which is only an hour later, but it made a significant difference given the time that I actually got to go, tend to go to bed. Um, so when I wake up in the morning, what I try to do is avoid my phone for, you know, at least the first hour or so. Because um, I find that, you know, with our phones these days, we have Twitter, Instagram, you can so easily find yourself on those platforms. And before you know it, time really passed. Um, and then you've got emails that you've got to respond to, messages coming from all over the place. And so what I like to do is, you know, wake up in the morning, um, you know, I spend some time really just reflecting. My to-do list would have been done the night before. I spend some time, like I have a gratitude journal as well. That's something that's really important to me. And I just reflect over the to-do list, what my key priorities are. I love to work out as well. So that I do that, you know, four days a week when I wake up at 6 a.m. Um, but yeah, I think that it can be quite challenging when we live in a world that there's just so much going on. So you kind of have to just shut the noise, like shut out the noise and just focus on what's really important. And I think that's very important for anyone, really, entrepreneurs, business leaders. And, you know, it really helps you be more efficient. How hard is it to not check your phone the first hour because it's easier said than done? So how many days did you have to do that before it became a habit to not check your phone? Each yeah, day, what is it? I think they, yeah, I think they say 30 days before something has a habit, right? So for me, obviously, it was initially very bad. I remember looking at my, um, on the iPhone, you, you can obviously see how much time you spend on apps. And there was a time where I realized how much I was spending on social apps. I was so horrified. Can you say the um, hours? I'm embarrassed to even say it. <laughs> it's that bad. 
and and that for me i was just so embarrassed that i just had to stop it and i found that having that morning routine just gets you into the flow of doing what's really important um and then you spend less time on social media and so on do you feel like everyone should wake up early or do you have you met people that are better off working into the night using their creativity and not waking up that early or do you believe it's for most people it's better to wake up early because if the rest of the world is sleeping you can basically work without any notifications yeah i used to be a night bird like i used to <laughs> night owl sorry so when i was at university for example i was one of the students that would stay awake throughout the night doing assignments um and i lived by that but what i've actually found is working in the morning is so much more efficient because like you said nothing really happening in the morning people are not messaging you during the morning you can get so much done before the actual day starts um and so i found it very very useful um so i just suggest that for anyone that hasn't tried it out try it out Agree, but can you take us back to sort of the the trading floor and the process of figuring out that you're not in the right place in finance? Because if you're young, I don't know how privileged you are in terms of the education and stuff. But if you've used a lot of money to give it, get an education and you find yourself in a job that pays well, it becomes very hard to take a career shift without having, you know, go through a lot of troubling thoughts in your head. So can you describe that process? starting at, at maybe the trading floor and then kind of navigating your way into where you want to be in finance? Yeah, so obviously I worked in, in banking and it's really intense um, and it's great. My parents love the fact that I worked at a really prestigious bank. I mean, who doesn't want their child to work at Goldman Sachs? Um, but I absolutely hated it. I knew from my first month that it wasn't for me. Um, and that's not to discredit anyone that does work in banking, but I just knew that I didn't like the environment. Um, and so when I told my parents I wanted to leave, they were horrified. They were like, you know, stay there for three years, two or three years, get some experience, and then you can do whatever you want. But I Can you describe friends. the culture there? Or is it, is it possible to describe a banking culture? Yeah, I would say that it's very rigorous. It's very cutthroat, um, very intense. So, you know, you spend a lot of time, um, I guess, trying to meet and, and try to ensure that you're working as hard as everyone else. And that can mean sometimes you're working to 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Um, and that for me was very difficult because I did want to have that work-life balance. Despite the fact I was making so much money, I felt like I couldn't enjoy it because on the weekends I'll be like a zombie, I'll be knackered. <laughs> um, and so, but one thing I would say that it's, it really gave me a great foundation. I think one of the great things about working in an investment bank is that it gives you such great training in terms of, you know, how to present and how to really operate within a corporate and well-structured environment. And so totally don't discredit that. And, you know, I highly, um, I, I, I admire people that continue to work within banking because it is very intense. Um, but for me, I knew at the time, like I had friends that were slightly older than me. They had left banking and gone on to do other things. And one of, one of the best advice that I received actually was that, you know, our careers are a marathon, not a sprint. So as I started looking for other roles, they were paying less. Um, but for me, it was, I had this view that, okay, this is where I am today, but it's not where I'm going to be forever. And if it's going to get me closer to where I want to go and something that I actually enjoy more, then I'm willing to make that sacrifice. And that's exactly what I did. So for me, it wasn't that, you know, yes, it was actually quite a scary experience, not you know, leaving and not knowing exactly what the future would look like. And obviously my parents in my ear saying, don't do this, don't do this. But then when I did it, I went into it knowing that, you know, it's okay to take risks within your career. If it didn't work out, I could easily go back into banking. And for me, I think that, you know, taking calculated risk is so important early on in your career because that's the best time to take it, right? Where you don't have major liabilities and you know you don't really have much to worry about. Um, and at the end of the day, you can always fall back on, on what you were originally doing. Definitely, but so in hindsight, when you decided this wasn't for me, how many years or months did it take before you found the right opportunity? Because you kind of, you, you said the word calculated risk, maybe you can dive a bit more into that concept because you shouldn't just take risk for the fact of taking risks, right? Well, 100% not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think when I say calculated risk, it's really weighing up the pros and cons. And you want to make sure that the pros are worth the potential cons. And so for me, the way I saw it was that, yes, I'm taking this big leap of faith. I'm leaving this industry. And it did take me, you know, I've, I've basically, I left university, went into banking, went into strategy consulting, and then went into to venture capital. So it took me essentially three different career paths for me to figure out what exactly I love to do and, and where I believe my gifts are. Um, and without having taken that risk, if I just stayed in banking, I never would have you know, discovered the world of venture capital that I love operating in today. And so when I say take calculated risk, I think that you just have to ensure that whatever risk you're taking, so me leaving banking, I knew that what the, what's the worst that could happen? Maybe I won't find something or maybe I'd go into something that I don't like. But at the end of the day, I could always step back into banking. Agree. So can you take talk a bit about your job today? Because you have like found a niche opportunity or maybe a, a theme that goes along with the venture capital business. Can you give a quick introduction to the company and how you view investing and what you're focused on? Yeah, sure. So um, I currently am a founding member and principal at ImpactX. So ImpactX, a UK-based venture capital fund, and we focus on backing underrepresented entrepreneurs. And when I say underrepresented entrepreneurs, I would guess if you look at the world of venture capital today, over the last 10 years, 1.5 trillion, well over that, has gone into to venture deals. However, when you look at the data, in Europe, for example, less than 0.5% of that capital went to black entrepreneurs last year. And if you look at female founders, the statistics are just as um, dire. And so when we talk about underrepresented, it's really essentially those entrepreneurs are not typically in your traditional venture capital portfolio. And for us, we see that as a huge opportunity because money is being left on the table and there's no shortage of pipeline from you know, female founders and you know, black and, and founders of other uh, ethnicities. Yeah, because that was my next question. So how big is the opportunity? It's not that women are not that interested in finance, do you think? Or is it just like they're lining up everyone wants to be a founder? Because I guess you have so many friends that it's easier for you to assess the talent pool. Because if I look at my friends, so many are into business. Mm -hmm. But if I look at the other gender, gender, I can't really see that many. But that doesn't mean they don't exist, right? So it's maybe a bit more complicated. Yeah, so I think there's a number of issues. I think, um, first of all, that they are out there. Um, I think it's just a matter of um, investors being more proactive and tapping into, you know, communities and groups that they wouldn't normally, um, because, you know, continuously on a daily basis, I'm meeting incredible female founders and so on. Um, and the other thing is, there's just this access challenge. So if you look at the venture capital ecosystem here in the UK, some of them don't even have a, an email address on their website. You have to get that warm introduction. If you're not within that network, then it's very difficult for you to even get a seat at the table to actually present to, to venture capitalists. And so there are a number of systemic issues, um, and which is why we see it as a huge opportunity because we continuously come across highly credible, you know, entrepreneurs, underrepresented entrepreneurs. So we definitely believe that there's a massive opportunity set there. 100% agree. So can you describe uh, the meetings you have with the founders? Do they, because you've seen so many different cases, are the meetings the same with the, call it the underrepresented founders? Or do you feel like there is like, maybe they don't believe in themselves as much, or is it just about getting to know them and they are exactly the same as the white males in Silicon Valley that thinks they can change the world with one app, for instance? Yeah, it's really interesting. I was having this conversation the other day. I actually believe that because of the, 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 I mean, for every pound that, let's say, a white male raises, it's significantly lower what female founders raise or what a black entrepreneur would raise, for example. And what I find is they're able to do a lot more with a lot less. And so I think that they tend to have a lot more resilience. Um, in terms of conversations, it's the same conversations I would have. So there's no difference um, from that perspective. Interesting. So can you break down maybe some companies you have backed or some people? Because it's very interesting to get like an introduction to the space because I don't feel like we have this big space in Northern Nor in Scandinavia or Norway or other countries. Yeah, sure. So one of the companies that we have invested in um, at ImpactX is a company called Marshmallow. 
um, they're an insurtech company and insurtech is, is obviously a space that's doing really well and it's it's got a lot of um, attention around it now given the recent lemonade lemonade ipo over in the us um, and they're a company that's you know done incredibly well in that you know they started out in 2017 and their growth has been really significant they're focusing on um, providing insurance to migrants and expats and also young people essentially they're using better data they better data points in order to price the insurance more um, effectively and so by that it's significantly cheaper um, so that's just one example of, of a component company in our portfolio but there's there's several more which how can many, be found on our website how many companies do you want to back the next couple of years and has you know covid changed that those plans or is it just business as usual at your end yeah, so we've actually invested in 18 companies. Um, in terms of, you know, what we're looking at, by the time we get to the end of the fund, it will probably be a portfolio of, of 10 companies that, you know, we've really doubled down on. Um, COVID hasn't had a major impact. And I think it's very important to, to highlight that. In the immediate aftermath of COVID, when we first found, how, found out about the lockdown and so on, there was um, a bit of, pause and reflect to really understand and I guess unfold the impact that it would have on some of our portfolio companies and as with many other funds we did spend a lot of time with our portfolio companies helping them think through you know ways in which they may want to adjust and so on but since then the market has rebounded and I think you know what's really interesting is if you look at the European um, ecosystem now I think there's like eight billion in in you know capital to be spent on investing in, in startups. There's more funds now than ever, and so what you're actually finding is you know great companies will continue to get funded in a pandemic, no pandemic, in a recession or no recession, as we saw in 20 um, 2007 2008, where we had the financial crisis. You know some of the greatest companies were created during that period. Instagram, Uber, for example, Airbnb. And I think we're, we're going to see the same thing again because recessionary environments create new problems to be solved. And it's those entrepreneurs that are really innovative and, and really um, able to understand what those problems are and solve for them that I think are gonna do really well throughout this period. I agree. Can you quickly just describe the VC industry, maybe in Europe and Africa, because I feel like there's so many new funds out there. And maybe the only one I know from UK is Harry Stebbings because he's half Norwegian. But how big is like the market, the VC market in Europe? Because do you feel like there's too many small funds or do you feel like there should be a consolidation or are the opportunity is very big because traditionally Europe doesn't win in the end, right? So if you look at the most valuable companies, they are based in China and US. Do you think this is going to change or do you think it's going to be the same as usual? Yeah, a very interesting question. So when I get, when I look at the, the European market, UK in particular, I do think that the UK market is slightly behind the US. I think what's happening is we are growing um, and we're starting to see a lot more unicorns, a lot more companies that are reaching those um, those sort of valuations that you're that you're referring to. What I find interesting is um, at the earlier stage, I think that there's a lot of funds concentrated at those levels, so seed, Series A. What happens is when it gets to those later stages, that's where you know there, there's not, there's really um, there's not that many funds. In recent years, there's been a lot more funds that have been established, but I think that's where, you know, we probably need a lot more um, capital available um, at that end. But I know that, you know, a number of funds are looking to, to break into that area. Interesting. So I guess you get so many emails and phone calls and Instagram chats with uh, asking you for advice. Maybe there are most female, I don't know, but what are your best advice that you give to people that want to, that see you as a role model and want to have sort of the same career track as you? I always say to entrepreneurs, focus on creating something of value because once you've created something of value, the money will follow. I feel as if there's so much um, focus put on raising capital when really the focus should be on your customers and, and really delivering that value because money is out there. Like I said, there's more funds than ever. And once you've proven that you have that value, investors will come knocking at your door. <laughs> and, and I know it's not that simple in reality, but I just think that 
the best money that you could ever get is from your customers as opposed to investors because raising funding doesn't equate to success you still have to do the work and execute on the business um so that's really where the focus should lie and you know fundraising can take a lot out of you if particularly if you're investing it you're raising at the wrong stage um in terms of careers i would say that you know really just figure out what it is that you are really passionate about what you love doing don't be afraid to take risk for me had i not have taken risk and you know spent the summer in ghana for example and you know not had changed the the different roles i did i never put, i would have realized my my love or venture um and so don't be afraid to take risk particularly when you're in your 20s um and you probably don't have much at stake i agree so just to your first point take care of your customers and the money will follow if we reverse engineer that into yourself why should founders team up with you and not other funds because it goes the other way around right if you have a great company every investor is knocking on your door so you can really just choose right if you have the best company in uk you can get the funding from everyone basically nice position to be in <laughs> Um, I would say that, you know, with our fund, we're, we're quite fortunate to have a great set of, of founding members and, you know, given the who they are, they're able to really help make those introductions, whether it be business development, whether it be recruitment, we can open those doors. And we really do look to partner with entrepreneurs. So whether that's an extra pair of pounds, um, wherever it's needed with the business, we will do what it takes to, to help in the best way possible. Um, along the journey because like they say it's, it's like a marriage <laughs> yeah because it's very important to just emphasize on this point because maybe i said it a bit the wrong way but if you partner up with the wrong vc partner it can actually bring you more work than less right yeah because yeah, if you I've get in, in, in yeah can you give some examples that maybe can like emphasize the points of how important it is to choose the right partner in at the vc mm -hmm. level yeah, I mean, um, without sharing any names, <laughs> many years ago, I sat on the board of a company and one of the investors was very difficult. They were continuously asking for more and more information on a monthly basis, which obviously took a lot of time out of the CEO's time where they should have been focusing on more strategic decisions and focusing on the business. So that all already was quite a huge burden um, in the request that they were receiving. And then actually when it came to raising funding, they were quite a significant shareholder. Um, they actually blocked new funding coming into the company and the company actually had to, you know, wind down effectively. Um, so that's, that's obviously a very severe case, but it just does highlight how important it, of a decision it is. So it is actually pretty close to a marriage. It's not like it's very, a yeah. <laughs> I mean, they say the typical marriage is what, seven years? And, you know, typical ventures, five to 10 years, so. <laughs> exactly. The data don't lie. Exactly. Just some last questions. You share your life philosophy quite a lot on Instagram and Twitter, etc. I think you have highlighted, highlighted or pinned that you have to celebrate every win, regardless how big it is, because in the end it compounds. Mm -hmm. Can you break down that principle? How do you identify a win? Is a win to wake up in the morning at six or not? <laughs> and, and if that's the case, how do you celebrate it? Yeah, um, really, really interesting question. So the reason why I highlighted that point is particularly when it comes to startups, I think entrepreneurs can really get bogged down on those really big wins. So, you know, reaching that milestone of 1 million in ARR and, you know, next, raising the next round and, you know, the really, really big wins. But we have to recognize that it takes a lot of small steps in order to get those big wins. So even when you are making those small steps, I'm not saying, saying like go down to the pub and just like take the day off, but it's really important that you do recognize them and your team recognize them collectively so that it continues to, keep them motivated and so on um so that's why i say like when you do have small wins like helping you get to the larger goals make sure you acknowledge them along the way how does that look in your personal life is it possible to give some examples yeah i mean um let me think of an example i guess for me at the moment i'm currently working on a project which i won't disclose just yet um but in order to do that i've had to do a lot of research background research to go into it and now I've collated all of that and I've had interviews with several people just to hear their perspective. Um, that That's a win for me. So the project isn't complete, but the work that's gone on in the background that's helped me get closer to it 
is something that I'm really pleased that I've achieved. So for example, over the weekend, I thought, let me give myself some time off and just have a night where I'm just relaxing, watching Netflix. And that for me was acknowledging that I had achieved something along my bigger goal. So how do you stay motivated? Because you said it's a marathon, not a sprint. You're in a field where I don't know if you felt underrepresented in your journey or had some major obstacles, but how do you motivate yourself? Because regardless of how smart and good in math you are, you will meet people that can break you down or you can meet roadblocks that are not fair on your behalf. And you will, every person will experience those types of uh, experiences. Yeah, I've, I've had my ton of, of roadblocks along the way. <laughs> um, but I think over time, what I've really learned is that not everyone is going to like you. Not everyone is going to be there for you. But those who are, they're the ones that you really need to lean into and really appreciate. Um, and they're the ones that you need to surround yourself with. And where people may be negative or not supportive of me, you just have to shut them out, really. Um, and that's something that I, I do. So I don't let things bother me. Early on in my career, I would sit and dwell and think, oh, my God, this person doesn't like me. Or, oh, my God, did I do something wrong? But that's part of life. I mean, you're going to have some people that like you. You're going to have some people that don't. You're going to have people that have a problem with you. But that's not that's not the end of the world. I agree. That sounds like a perfect ending. Let's end it there. <laughs> it's, it's not the end of the world. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. It's been a great chat. Hi, everyone. Christopher here again. Just a few things before you leave the show. If you liked this episode, it would be great if you could give it a review and also share it with your professional network. If you want to get in touch with me, Twitter is the place. Just go to at Chris Wunheim. You can also find this information in the show notes. Hope to see you tune in to the next episode and take care.